This is the Music History In-Depth Podcast for July 17th through the 23rd. On this week's episode, a band turns a silly little song into the beginning of the end of a music genre, a music festival trilogy that started out with peace and love ends with violence, and we say happy birthday to two music legends and a pretty cool record label owner who happens to be a billionaire. This show goes more in depth about some of the events that we put on our daily podcast, the Music History Today podcast, which drops every single day, including weekends, wherever you get your podcast from. Now, on to this week's episode. First up, back in the late 1980s, one city ruled rock music, Los Angeles, California. From the sunset, strip it and grab the rest of the world. Bands like Van Halen started the hard rock migration in the late 1970s, which was actually brought on by bands like Kiss back in the mid-1970s. But the 80s saw the rise of the hair band rock. Bon Jovi started the Aquanet hairspray revolution in New Jersey, but L.A. is where it really took hold. There were bands like Motley Crue, Warrant, Winger, Cinderella, and Rat. Those bands put their own spin on the hairband style and sometimes added makeup. Lots and lots of makeup. They were the pretty boy bands who talked about good times and girls. They played shows at places like the Whiskey A Go-Go and the Troubadour. They lived the rock and roll lifestyle of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, only they were prettier. Their music was fun, but not too heavy on meaning. Back then, that was cool. It was the 80s, after all. It was the decade of fun. Around the same late 80s time period in the same exact city, a band was quietly making waves on the Sunset Strip that would soon put the first nail in the coffin of the hairband era. Guns and Roses might have looked like their Hollywood counterparts, but their sound was somehow more raw. While Poison sang about having nothing but a good time, Guns danced with Mr. Brownstone. Slash chainsawed his way through their music with his thrashing guitar riffs, while arguably the greatest rock vocalist ever, Axel Rose, pierced every word with his five-octave voice. Guns was the rock act that would beat the crap out of you and leave with your girlfriend and all of her girlfriends. Their debut album, Appetite for Destruction, was released on July 21st, 1987, but without much fanfare. In fact, their first single, Welcome to the Jungle, who many people mistakenly think was their second single, it was actually their first, went absolutely nowhere. Then they started touring. A lot. About a year after their album Appetite for Destruction came out, a video for one of their songs started going up the charts on MTV. It was a power ballad, but it wasn't like any other power ballad that anyone had heard from one of those sissy pop metal groups. This one was harder, edgier, angrier, but still about love. Slash hated the song at first and thought it was kind of silly. Ironically, it's mainly because of his guitar playing on it, especially his now famous opening riff, that actually made the song popular. After this silly little love song became popular, Welcome to the Jungle was re-released. After that, it was game over for the hair bands. When the song, Sweet Child of Mine, cracked the Billboard Top 40 singles chart on July 23, 1988, it signaled the hearse to be put on standby for the pretty boy hairband era. Grunge finally finished the kill when the one-two punch of Nirvana and Pearl Jam burst onto the scene about a year or two later. The release of Guns N' Roses' iconic debut album, Appetite for Destruction, on July 21st, 1987. Their silly little love song, as they called it, Sweet Child of Mine, cracked the Billboard Top 40 singles chart and helped to end the hairband era on July 23rd, 1988. On to a hard rock group that managed to survive Guns N' Roses and grunge music, although it wasn't easy, 
The group Def Leppard started in 1976 as the band Atomic Mass in the city of Sheffield, England, by school friends Rick Savage, Tom Kenning, and Pete Doubleday. Pete Willis joined in 1977 along with Nick Mackley, Andy Nicholas, Melanie Davis, Nick Hornt, and Paul Hampshire as members were joining and leaving all the time, mainly because they were all still in high school, mind you. Singer Joe Elliott auditioned to be one of the guitarists, but it was decided that he would become the lead singer. Guitarist Steve Clark and drummer Rick Allen came on board soon thereafter in 1978. The name Def Leppard came from a newspaper headline that read, Def Leppard, Def Leppard's Deformed, as in D-E-A-F, not D-E-F, as it became known as. On July 18, 1978, Def Leppard, with the lineup of Elliot, Henning, Willis, Clark, Savage, and Allen, played their first gig in front of 150 people at the Westfield School in Sheffield, England. Right around the time that they were working on their EP, the Def Leppard EP, Kenning left the band and was replaced by Frank Noon. By the time all of the band shuffling had finished and they released their debut album, the group finally consisted of Savage, Clark, Elliot, Allen, and Willis. The group released their debut album, On Through the Night, on March 14, 1980. The album originally didn't do too well except in the Sheffield area. Eventually it caught on and at one time hit number 12 on the Billboard Albums chart. It also got the attention of legendary producer Mutt Lang, who had produced ACDC's legendary Back in Black album and would go on to craft Brian Adams and Shania Twain's albums along with marrying Shania. Mutt took a liking to the band and would go on to produce the band's next few big albums. Mutt and the band worked on the group's follow-up album, High and Dry, which was released on July 11, 1981. The band didn't have an official hit from the album, and the sales figures were not all that spectacular. The band did have a music video, though, for their song, Bringing on the Heartbreak, which would turn the song into a cult hit, as it was one of the first hard rock music videos that the fledgling TV channel MTV played. MTV would actually play a huge part in the group's success on their third album. The group got to work on that third album called Pyromania. For this album, there were a few changes. The first was that they changed guitarists. Pete Willis was let go from the group for excessive drinking, something that would eventually help claim the life of their other guitarist, Steve Clark. Guitarist Phil Collin came on board from the band Girl to replace Willis. The band also changed their sound to a more glam rock style instead of heavy metal. Mutt was again at the helm for this one. Pete Willis actually played most of the rhythm guitar and contributed songwriting to a few tracks before he was finally let go. This album was one of those rare cases when the album came out before the first single was released. Pyromania was released on January 20th, 1983. The first single, Photograph, was released on February 3rd, 1983. What made the song and eventually the album so popular was that Photograph, their second single, Rock of Ages, and their third single, Foolin', all got heavy rotation airplay on MTV, which was in full swing by then as being a cultural force and a major record pusher. The album was the second biggest selling album of 1983, right behind that album by some guy who wore a sparkling single glove and danced the moonwalk. Jackson or somebody rather. To date, the album has sold over 10 million certified copies. Def Leppard then began work on their follow-up album, Hysteria. However, tragedy struck when Rick Allen was involved in a car accident of his own making. On New Year's Eve 1984, Rick was driving his Corvette down a country road near Sheffield when he came up behind a slower car. And rather than slow up and get behind the other car, he tried to speed up to get around the other car. Unfortunately for him, physics kind of took over. He lost control of his Corvette, hit a wall, and crashed the car into a field, completely severing his left arm. 
Doctors frantically tried to reattach the arm, but eventually he had to have it amputated once it got an infection. Now, normally, that would be the end for a drummer. After all, you kind of need your arms to play drums. Rick, however, was a different beast, and this was not your average ordinary group of guys called a band. Rather than quit the band, Rick and a few other people worked out a drum kit where he could drum with two feet and one arm. What's also amazing is that the band stuck by him and didn't even consider getting rid of him. The band did get another drummer to help Rick with drumming when they played a few tour warm-up gigs in Ireland, but they soon realized that Rick was going to be fine, so the idea of a side drummer was squashed. In fact... During one gig, Rick actually drummed with one of the bones from his severed arm because, I don't know, rock and roll? No, who knows? All of this pushed back the making of Hysteria, but the album finally got released on August 3rd, 1987. Hysteria was a monster hit, selling over 10 million copies, producing big hits like Pour Some Sugar On Me, Animal, Love Bites, Armageddon It, and Rocket, plus making Def Leppard one of the few artists to have more than one original album sell over 10 million copies. It also helped producer Mutt Lang to cement his place as one of the most successful producers of all time, after also having 10 million record sellers with ACDC and also with Shania Twain. After finishing up their successful Hysteria tour, they started work on their album Adrenalize, but tragedy would strike the band again as guitarist Steve Clark's alcohol addiction spiraled out of control. He tried to get help, but on January 8, 1991, Steve's demons finally caught up with him. He passed away from taking prescription drugs and alcohol, which is never a good idea, no matter who you are. The band pressed on without him and released Adrenalized on March 31, 1992. The album was a hit, although it wasn't as big a hit as Pyromania or Hysteria. It spawned the songs Let's Get Rocked, Have You Ever Needed Someone So Bad, and Heaven Is. Before they went out on tour again, though, they auditioned guitarists to take Steve Clark's place, and they found Vivian Campbell, who used to play with the groups Whitesnake and also Dio. After that, the guys put out a bunch of different albums like Retroactive and Slang, but by this time, music had changed. The aforementioned grunge rock movement took over and kicked Def Leppard's style of rock to the curb. Plus, they almost had another tragedy when Vivian Campbell was diagnosed with cancer, which he did eventually recover from. Through it all, Def Leppard never lost their legion of fans, and to this very day, they still continue to be huge concert draws. They even did a couple of Las Vegas residencies. They still sell out huge arenas to this very day, even if their albums don't sell the 10 million copies like they used to. Throughout their career, Def Leppard released 12 albums, their last being 2022's Diamond Star Halos. They've been nominated for seven American Music Awards, winning two of them in 1989. They were nominated for six MTV Video Music Awards, although despite the fact that it was the music video who actually helped to push them, they never actually won an MTV Video Music Award. To date, they have not been nominated for Grammy Awards, although they really should have in the 1980s, let's be honest. All right, so the critics don't love them. Doesn't matter. They've sold over 100 million records, and they've been called the 31st greatest hard rock artist, at least according to VH1. And it all started when Def Leppard played their very first gig at the Westfield School in Sheffield, England, on July 18th, 1978. Before we go any further, we'd like to tell you about our other podcasts. 
The Music History Today podcast goes over the daily events in music history and drops daily, including weekends, on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. There's also the Music Halls of Fame podcast, which talks about a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, along with other Music Halls of Fame's museums and walks of fame. The Music Halls of Fame podcast drops every Thursday and can also be found on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to this podcast. On July 22, 1999, a music festival began with a lot of fanfare. Unfortunately, it would end with a scene straight out of Lord of the Flies. In 1969, the original Woodstock Festival was one of those festivals that your parents and grandparents loved to talk to you about, even though they probably didn't even go to it. It was a summer of love and everybody got along great, even though it was the summer of the Vietnam War and the civil rights movement, marred by many very disgusting unsanitary conditions and an awful lot of acid trips. It did, however, ironically make a lot of money. Not the actual festival itself, but mainly it was due to the selling of the rights to the movie and music soundtrack to the festival not the actual ticket box office, which was an utter failure. And no, Mom, you didn't go to Woodstock. You were in England. You can't lie to me. Dad told me. Anyway, in 1994, the organizers decided to put together another festival. This one was really good, but was marred with the same problems as the original one. The festival did, however, make a name for Green Day, Melissa Etheridge, and Nine Inch Nails, among many others. In 1999, the Woodstock crew decided to go back to the well one more time. This time, though, things were different. Instead of doing the festival on farmland like the original Woodstock in the 94 version, they put on the festival on a former Air Force base where they could strictly enforce security. While the other two festivals had gate crashers and people smuggling in food and other things, this one was having none of that. Since you couldn't bring in your own food and water, that meant that you had to buy it there, and it wasn't even cheap. 20-ounce bottles of water and soda were going for $4 each, which, think about it, back in 99, that was a lot of money. A slice of pizza was 12 bucks. Add to that a one and a half mile walk between the two main stages across an airport tarmac that had temperatures of over 100 degrees Fahrenheit with no shade. And you had set the stage for some really bad things to happen. And they happened. Oh boy, did they happen. The music itself for the festival was actually good. It was the era of Rage Against the Machine, Limp Bizkit, Jamiroquai, the Red Hot Chili Peppers, Sheryl Crow, and Creed. Even James Brown and George Clinton showed up for this thing. The problems began when the crowds became violent during some of the musical acts. There were reports of violence and sexual assaults during Limp Bizkit's set. Then, on the last night, tragedy struck. On the last night of the concerts, the Red Hot Chili Peppers were performing. An anti-violence group handed out candles. They were supposed to be lit for a vigil during the song Under the Bridge. Instead, they were used to set fires all over the festival grounds. The crowds burned everything, including a radio tower. They took out their anger about being overcharged for essential goods and being cooped up in oppressive heat out on anything and everything. There were allegations of some more sexual assaults, and even MTV, who were covering the entire festival, had to pull its crew out. If the first two Woodstock festivals were about peace and love, then Woodstock 99 would be called the festival about corporate greed and violence. And it all started on July 22nd, 1999. Time for some birthdays and passings, and there's a lot of them to talk about this week. First off, the passings, as we always like to end on a high note. 
Linkin Park lead singer Chester Bennington was born on March 20, 1976. Bennington found success with Linkin Park after the release of their debut album, Hybrid Theory, back in 2000. The album's blend of new metal, rap, and alternative rock resonated with a generation, selling over 10 million copies in America alone. Chester's distinctive voice, which ranged from soulful serenades to aggressive screams, became a key part of the band's identity and sound. Tracks like In the End and Crawling showcased his versatility and raw emotion. While Bennington served as Linkin Park's primary lead vocalist, he often shared duties with Mike Shinoda, whose rapping added yet another layer to the band's musical tapestry. Together, Bennington and Shinoda co-wrote lyrics, further solidifying their creative partnership. Linkin Park continued to achieve commercial success with albums like Meteora in 2003 and Minutes to Midnight in 2007, with both of those reaching number one on the Billboard 200 chart. Bennington's talent extended, of course, beyond Linkin Park. He served as lead vocalist for other bands, including Stone Temple Pilots after they lost their lead singer, and his own project called Dead by Sunrise. However, Linkin Park remained his most commercially successful and critically acclaimed endeavor. Distraught, however, by his best friend Chris Cornell's suicide only two months earlier on May 18, 2017, Chester Bennington committed suicide at the age of 44 on July 20th, 2017, the birthday of his best friend Chris Cornell. We'll get to Chris later on. The death of Chester Bennington of Lincoln Park, July 20th, 2017. Next up, Tony Bennett rose to prominence in the 1950s, captivating audiences with his interpretations of jazz standards and popular songs. His charisma and smooth delivery made him a favorite, earning him the title The Last of the Great Saloon Singers. He wasn't just a performer of existing hits, though. Bennett possessed a unique ability to breathe new life into familiar melodies, making them all his own. This talent not only revived classic songs, but also to help create new standards, like his signature tune, I Left My Heart in San Francisco, which was not his song originally, but it is now. Bennett's achievements are numerous. He won a staggering 19 Grammy Awards throughout his prestigious career, including the Lifetime Achievement Award. His rich discography includes countless hit songs and critically acclaimed albums. He also enjoyed immense popularity outside of the United States, performing internationally and collaborating with artists from around the world. In 2021, the world found out that Tony Bennett was battling Alzheimer's disease. Despite the prognosis, he continued to perform, with his final concert taking place at the iconic Radio City Music Hall in New York City. The performance, a testament to his enduring passion for music, was a poignant farewell to a legendary singer. Tony Bennett passed away from Alzheimer's on July 21st, 2023 at the age of 96. Next up, the legendary Miss Amy Winehouse, the British singer-songwriter whose powerful vocals and confessional lyrics captured the world's attention, had a tragically short career that was cut short at the age of 27, which of course is a very popular club for musicians to find themselves in, unfortunately. Despite her limited time in the spotlight, Winehouse's impact on music is completely undeniable. Amy emerged in the early 2000s with a unique blend of jazz, soul, and R&B. Her debut album, Frank, garnered critical acclaim for its witty lyrics and her powerful, soulful voice. Amy wasn't afraid to bear her soul in her music, tackling themes of love, heartbreak, and addiction with unflinching honesty. And this raw vulnerability resonated with audiences, especially young women who identified with her struggles. 
Amy's sophomore album, Back to Black, released in 2006, became a global phenomenon. Hits like Rehab and You Know I'm No Good showcased her songwriting talent and her ability to blend genres seamlessly. The album won five Grammy Awards, solidifying her place as one of the leading voices in music. However, Amy's personal life was marred by struggles with substance abuse. Her battles with addiction became a constant theme in the media, overshadowing her musical achievements a lot, actually. Despite attempts at rehab, her health deteriorated and her public appearances became increasingly erratic. On July 23, 2011, Amy Winehouse was found dead at her home at the age of 27. The official cause of death was accidental alcohol poisoning. Her passing sent shockwaves throughout the music industry and sparked a conversation about the pressures of fame and the dangers of addiction, one that unfortunately we continue to have year in and year out. While Amy's personal demons ultimately cut her life short, her musical legacy continues to live on. Her raw talent, confessional lyrics, and genre-bending sound continue to inspire artists to this day. Amy Winehouse's story serves as a cautionary tale, but it also serves as a testament to the power of music to connect with listeners on a deep emotional level. Amy Winehouse passed away from an accidental alcohol poisoning on July 23, 2011, at the age of 27. Billie Holiday, who was born Eleonora Fagan on April 7, 1915, was one of the most influential jazz singers of all time. Her life, however, was a whirlwind of both triumph and tragedy. It was marked by poverty, racism, addiction, and a voice that could stir the soul. Holiday's childhood was marred by poverty and abuse. She dropped out of school young and faced homelessness and exploitation. Yet, her singing talent was undeniable. By the early 1930s, Billy found herself in Harlem, New York, the heart of the burgeoning jazz scene at that time. Talent scout John Hammond recognized her raw talent and launched her recording career. Nicknamed Lady Day by saxophonist Lester Young, Billy's voice was unlike any other. With a deep emotional resonance and an intuitive grasp on phrasing, she could imbue even the simplest song with profound meaning. Hits like God Bless the Child and Strange Fruit, which was a very powerful protest song against lynching, showcased her artistry and social consciousness at the same time. Despite her success, though, Billie's life was a constant battle. She battled heroin addiction throughout her career, a struggle that stemmed from early traumas. Additionally, she faced racism in the segregated South, especially in America at the time. And even while achieving national fame, she was denied entry to hotels and restaurants due strictly to her race. Billy's personal demons also took a toll. Arrests, health problems, and the loss of her cabaret card in New York City hampered her career in the 1950s. Yet, her voice never lost its power. She continued to perform and record until her untimely death on July 17, 1959. Billie Holiday passed away from cirrhosis of the liver brought on by years of drug and alcohol abuse at the age of 44. At the time of her death, Billy had been arrested and handcuffed for drug possession a month earlier and was placed under police guard as she was left dying in the hospital. The police pulled the police guard a few hours before her death once it became painfully obvious that she wasn't going to survive that day. The death of legendary jazz great Billie Holiday on July 17th, 1959, at the age of 44. Now, after all that gloominess, 
there are some important birthdays this week. But instead of just saying happy birthday to one person, I'm going to give you a few. First up, this first man was born on July 18, 1950. From his early years, he was known as a rebel. He still starts up businesses in order to disrupt entire sectors. He is quite possibly one of those few billionaires who you could see yourself having fun with and not hating the guy. He's an adventurer who has almost killed himself on more than a few occasions, literally. However, he got his start and made his money originally by starting a record label. He signed Mike Oldfield, whose album Tubular Bells would be the musical background for the movie The Shining, where we recently just lost the great Shelley Duvall, who was in that movie and played Jack Nicholson's wife. He signed a rebellious rock group called the Sex Pistols and engineered out of this world publicity stunts that really, to this day, still piss people off in fitting with the Pistols' nature. He also signed the Rolling Stones, Peter Gabriel, Janet Jackson, Culture Club, Steve Winwood, and Paula Abdul, among many others. The man known these days for trying to change the world and bringing space tourism to fruition, but who made a name for himself by trying to break hot air balloon records at the time. The rebellious businessman who owns over a hundred companies but they all have his imprint on them, and his empire all started with a record label. The man who turned his record label, Virgin, into the biggest independent record label in the world at that time, at least for a while, Sir Richard Branson, who was born on July 18, 1950. The second man was born July 22, 1947. He was known for being a drummer for a very successful rock band who hold the record for having the biggest selling album in the 20th century. He and his band co-founder got their start as members of Linda Ronstadt's backup band. And after his band broke up, he went on to have a very successful solo career talking about the end of the innocence with the boys of summer and some dirty laundry thrown in. However, after famously saying that his band would get back together when, quote, hell froze over, hell froze over, and the band got back together. And they're still performing to this day after taking some time off to deal with the tragic passing of his friend, brother-in-arms, and co-founder of the Eagles, Glenn Fry. In fact, this is their supposedly farewell tour this coming year. The drummer of the Eagles, whose greatest hits album is the biggest selling album of all time in America, with Michael Jackson's album Thriller being the biggest selling album of all time worldwide. The Boy of Summer, The End of the Innocence, with a little dirty laundry. Mr. Don Henley, born July 22nd, 1947. This next man was born exactly six years before Don Henley in 1941. If you are a fan of early hip-hop, then known as rap music, then you know that a lot of samples came from essentially two different people, James Brown and George Clinton. In fact, they were sampled so much that they could have never have worked again in their lives and lived off the royalties. If any of those people actually paid them royalties for the samples they took slash stole, let's face it, stole. What James Brown did for soul and R&B music, George did for funk music, injecting it with a psychedelic blend, inventing a new form of music called P-Funk, and all with a performance showmanship that has often been imitated but never duplicated ever since. George Clinton was born on July 22, 1941. He started a group at age 15 in Plainfield, New Jersey, called the Parliaments, whose name he took from Parliament Cigarettes. In the early years, their musical style was influenced by doo-wop and vocal R&B acts at the time. They garnered local recognition for their soulful performances and tight harmonies, displaying early signs of their musical prowess. 
1964, George decided to get a backup band for the group and drop doo-wop for smooth funk. His first backup band had Eddie Hazel on lead guitar, Tall Ross on rhythm guitar, Billy Bass Nelson on bass, Tiki Fullwood on drums, and Mitt Key Atkins on keyboards. The Parliaments caught the attention of Motown Records in the early 1960s. After Motown signed them, they released a bunch of singles, including the regional hit I Want to Testify in 1967. However, despite some regional success in the upper Midwest area of America, the Parliament struggled to achieve widespread national recognition under the guidance of Motown. Frustrated with Motown at that point and looking for a new direction, the group underwent a significant transformation. Due to the record label that they ended up on, Revolt Records, going bankrupt, they lost the rights to the name The Parliaments. The Parliaments then rebranded themselves as Parliament, singular, shedding their previous sound and embracing a more experimental and progressive approach. This transformation allowed them to explore new musical territories and break free from the Motown assembly line way of doing things. Parliament's evolution was marked by a fusion of funk, soul, and various musical influences, drawing inspiration from the raw energy of James Brown, the psychedelic sounds at that point of Jimi Hendrix, and the eclectic nature that was Sly and the Family Stone. Parliament crafted a distinct funk sound characterized by infectious bass lines, intricate horn arrangements, and Clinton's very distinctive vocal style. The band's breakthrough came with the release of their landmark album, The Mothership Connection, in 1975. This album introduced the concept of an intergalactic funk mythology with band members portraying extraterrestrial characters. The concept became a recurring theme in their subsequent albums and live performances, sometimes with over 40 performers on stage, and with the iconic Mothership stage prop becoming a symbol of Parliament's imaginative and theatrical approach. The Mothership stage prop is actually now in the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C., along with some of the group's costumes. And if you ever get the chance to go to D.C., that museum is a must to visit on your visit. Trust me. In 1968, though, in between all of this fun, George decided to add an additional project to his repertoire. He took his backup band and called the new band Funkadelic, establishing their distinct musical identity and creating the new musical genre known as P-Funk. Billy Bass Nelson is the person who's actually credited with calling the band Funkadelic, not George Clinton. This change reflected their intention to delve into a heavier guitar-oriented sound while still retaining the rhythmic foundation of funk music. And it was also during this time that the band's lineup expanded to include such legendary performers as the great, iconic Mr. Bootsy Collins on bass and Bernie Worrell on keyboards. Eventually, after having both groups running separately at the same time to quench George's creative ideas, both bands would merge into one and simply be called Parliament Funkadelic. There were also spin-offs of those bands, such as Bootsy's Rubber Band and The Brides of Funkenstein. Funkadelic's self-titled debut album, released in 1970, showcased their experimental approach to music. Tracks like I'll Bet You and Music for My Mother epitomized their unique blend of psychedelic elements, distorted guitar riffs, and soulful vocals. Funkadelic's subsequent albums continued to push the boundary of musical innovation. For instance, Free Your Mind and Your Ass Will Follow, which was put out in 1970, and Maggot Brain in 1971 exemplified the band's cosmic themes and experimentationalism. These albums featured extended jam, soulful ballads, and mesmerizing guitar solos, creating expansive sonic landscapes that captivated listeners. While initially operating outside of the mainstream, 
Funkadelic achieved commercial success with the release of their album One Nation Under a Groove in 1978. The title track became an instant funk anthem, embodying the band's message of unity and musical liberation. This commercial breakthrough propelled Funkadelic into the mainstream, solidifying their position as one of the foremost funk rock acts of the era. Funkadelic's influence extended far beyond their commercial success. Their groundbreaking fusion of funk, rock, and psychedelia inspired countless musicians across all genres. Their experimental sound, socially conscious lyrics, and mesmerizing stage performances left an indelible mark on the music industry. Artists, for instance, ranging from Prince and the Red Hot Chili Peppers to contemporary funk and rock acts continue to draw inspiration from Funkadelic's eclectic and boundary-breaking approach. As the 1980s came around, the collective broke up and went their separate ways for a while. A lot of them went on to do other projects, solo albums, or guest spots on other artists' tours. For instance, Bernie Worrell, for a time, actually went on tour with the group The Pretenders. Bootsy Collins ended up on a number of other artists' songs, most notably D-Light's classic dance track, Groove is in the Heart, along with putting out his own albums, of which he has a brand new one that is out now. George kept going with solo work and had the hit song Atomic Dog, which got sampled a ton of times, along with getting put in various commercials and movies having dogs in them, of course. George eventually put a new collective of artists together for the 21st century, named them Parliament Funkadelic, and then went out on tour. However, due to worsening medical conditions, he is either in the middle of his now lengthy farewell tour as we speak, or he's actually, I think, finally finished in terms of touring, although he may still do a performance here and there, but that's about it these days. Either separately or as a combined collective, the groups put out some of the most iconic funk albums and songs of all time. Albums such as Mothership Connection, One Nation Under a Groove, and Up for the Downstroke, along with singles such as Stomp, which is actually my personal favorite, One Nation Under a Groove, and Flashlight. They've also received a Grammy Award as well as a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Recording Academy. When it came time for the collective to be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the list of official inductees was whittled down from almost 100 different members over the decades to 15 inductees. And it all came from the mind of the P-Funk master himself, the legendary, the iconic Mr. George Clinton, born July 22nd, 1941. Finally, Christopher John Cornell was born on July 20th, 1964. He co-founded Soundgarden in 1984. Initially playing drums and singing, he transitioned to solely vocals, showcasing his powerful four-octave range. Soundgarden, alongside bands like Nirvana and Pearl Jam, emerged from Seattle's grunge scene, challenging the hair metal dominance of the late 1980s. Their music, categorized by heavy riffs, angst-ridden lyrics, and Cornell soaring vocals, resonated with a generation that was disillusioned with mainstream trends, especially the hairband era. Soundgarden's albums, particularly Louder Than Love in 1989 and Super Unknown in 1994, achieved critical and commercial acclaim. Singles like Black Hole Sun and Spoon Man became staples of alternative rock radio, showcasing Cornell's songwriting prowess and ability to weave melody with raw emotion. Soundgarden's influence transcended grunge, inspiring countless future rock and metal acts. Following Soundgarden's disbandment in 1997, Cornell then formed Audio Slave with former members of Rage Against the Machine. The band achieved significant success, releasing three acclaimed albums before splitting in 2007. Cornell then embarked on a successful solo career, exploring a wider musical palette while still retaining his signature vocals. 
He contributed to numerous movie soundtracks, including his iconic rendition of You Know My Name for the James Bond film Casino Royale. Soundgarden then reunited in 2010, continuing the tour until Chris's untimely death by suicide on May 18, 2017. The late, great Mr. Chris Cornell of the group's Soundgarden and also Audio Slave, born July 20th, 1964. And that is it for the Music History In-Depth podcast for July 17th through the 23rd. Thank you very much for listening and watching.